Dr. King believed in civil rights. Well, I'm here to tell you that the white man ain't too civil and he ain't too right. Malcolm believed in human rights. I'm here to tell you that the white man ain't too human and he ain't too right. It makes no difference whether it's civil rights or human rights. You must weigh the circumstances surrounding the very origin of the white man into the world to then determine if he's capable of being civil. If he's capable of being human. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, a prominent African-American Muslim minister an activist was known for his unapologetic stance on human rights issues, particularly for black communities in America and globally. His views were shaped by a belief that black people are entitled to justice, equality and respect, often advocating for more assertive self-defense and independence. The subject that you have given me, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, human rights and civil rights, the challenge of the 21st century is quite a challenging subject. Of all our studies, of course, history is best qualified and most attractive to reward our research. If we know what happened yesterday, we can intelligently discuss today because today is built on yesterday and tomorrow is built on today. And we should be intelligent enough that if we know what happened yesterday, that we are not likely to let the same thing go down again today. Our unity in sisterhood, brotherhood, and struggle is profound, principled, and forever. We choose the revolution of our people and the liberation of our people as our life's goal and struggle as the method to achieve it. Our struggle is constantly and continuously against the oppressor and against all in us, which is in contradiction to our values and the choice we've made. We choose the liberation of our people and our choice is conscious, full, and free. And we accept all risk and welcome all rewards it might bring. We have nothing better. Nothing better and more revolutionary and rewarding to do with our lives than to struggle. Struggle to bring into being a new world. A world in which we, our children and our families, can breathe and create and stand and walk in a warmer sun. This is the Kawaida Kiapo. And I want to begin with a note from Langston Hughes, since at this time of the year, there is so much talk about the dream and the dreamer. Langston Hughes gives us this as it was made popular through Lorraine Hansberry in A Raisin in the Sun. And it begins, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over? like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Brothers and sisters, in a laboratory no experiment is a failure. Even if the results of that experiment only proves that it can't be done that way, that experiment is not a failure. The experiment of the life and legacy of the man that we know to be Martin Luther King Jr., the experiment of that life was not a failure. It was not a failure. It serves us well today. 
Because even if it does nothing else, it tells us that it can't work that way. And when you find out in an experiment that it can't work that way, then the results advances your study, advances your research, and it should put you on firm footing toward real resolution and the best results that you might hope for. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here 30 years ago and as he walked in Selma, Alabama and worked in Selma, Alabama and Birmingham, Alabama and Montgomery, Alabama and Chicago and throughout the hells of North America as the chairman or as the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as Dr. King worked 30 years ago, for us, it is written in the scriptures, what greater love could a man have or a woman than to lay down their life for their brother, for their sister, for their friend. Dr. King laid down his life for us. And if for no other reason, we must honor him for laying down his life life for us but we must analyze his life and we as the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that it is after one has made the transition after they have made the transition to what some call death but what others call to the realm of the ancestors or the Egungun then a period can be placed behind the testament of that life and then we can carefully and critically make an analysis of that life. Dr. King laid down his life for us and Dr. King believed in the moral conscience of the white man. And since we are talking about civil rights and human rights here tonight, I think it's fitting that we begin right there. He believed in the moral conscience of the white man. Well, I'm here tonight at D&J to tell you that the white man ain't got no morals and he ain't got no conscience. Dr. King believed in civil rights. Well, I'm here to tell you that the white man ain't too civil and he ain't too right. Malcolm believed in human rights. I'm here to tell you that the white man ain't too human and he ain't too right. It makes no difference whether it's civil rights or human rights. You must weigh the circumstances surrounding the very origin of the white man into the world to then determine if he's capable of being civil. If he's capable of being human. This we must put on the scale of myot and give it the myotic weigh in and see if it strikes the myotic balance. And if it does not strike the myotic balance, then we must make sure that we are not victims of history because it is written that he or she who does not learn the lessons of history is doomed to repeat them. Thirty years ago, the prestigious, pristine, presidential White House Commission set up by Lyndon Baines Johnson, a redneck, camel-breath hunky from Texas, an outlaw from Texas, a gun-slinging outlaw from Texas. Lyndon Baines Johnson set up the Kerner Commission. And the Kerner Commission determined that America 30 years ago was two Americas, one black and one white, separate and unequal. And that the number one problem in America 30 years ago was white racism. 30 years later, after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Kerner Commission has reconvened and determined that America is still two Americas, one black and one white, separate still, unequal still, and that the number one problem in America today is still white racism. 30 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they questioned Jet Magazine staff and journalists questioned the widow of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They questioned 
Sister Coretta Scott King. They questioned his daughter. They questioned his son. They questioned the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker. They questioned a uh, former city councilman Hosea Williams, who was one of his right-hand men. They questioned Amos, I mean Andy <laughs> Young, <laughs> former mayor. of Atlanta, Georgia, and former ambassador to the United to the United Nations. <laughs> they questioned them. And they questioned others and they put the question to them about success or failure. They put the question to them, have we really made progress 30 years? after Dr. King. They wanted them to analyze the dream of Dr. King. And they all said that they could see some change here and there. But they all said, they all agreed that America had a long, long way to go. Some of them were even specific. 30 years after Dr. King, if we're going to deal with civil rights and human rights and we're going to weigh it properly, we must understand that affirmative action, which was important to Dr. King, but never has been important to me because the action has never been affirmative. We don't need affirmative action. We need reparations and freedom and independence, liberation and salvation. But affirmative action was important to Dr. King. 30 years after Dr. King, affirmative action does not even remain a dream anymore. It's a nightmare now. A recalcitrant cold wind blowing through Congress, blowing through the Senate, blowing through the White House, whistling throughout the hells of North America has now swept affirmative action almost but from the scene today. 30 years after the dream of the dreamer, mm -hmm. Section 8 entitlements, quota systems that were supposed to level the playing field after people had been robbed of their names, their language, their religion, their culture, their God, their folkways, their mores, their norms, robbed of the very power of our own being. All of that is being erased today. Such measures that were supposed to be set up to level the playing field. Now you've got devils, you've got so-called Jews, imposter Jews coming up with theories and theorems on a bell curve. Other crackers saying that we are genetically inferior. Other crackers saying that we are stuck at the bottom. Other crackers saying that we are black jelly beans stuck at the bottom of the bag or the jar. Look at it. You break both of my legs, and then you call a race. <laughs> break both of my legs, and you stand, somebody working with you, stands at the starter's line, fires the starter's pistol, and you're the only one running. You break the tape, and then you turn around and criticize me because I haven't made it to the finish line yet. I'm dragging alone because you've broken both of my damn legs. How could you expect me to finish? The white man breaks our legs and then has a race and then says, well, you, you, you really are uh, intellectually inferior to me. You robbed me of my name, my language, my religion, my culture, my God, my folkways, my mores, my norms, and then you turn around and give me a goddamn test? How could you expect me to score like you? 30 years after Dr. King, a Negro sits on the Supreme Court bench named Clarence Thomas, standing always against his people and always for the enemy who put him there, married to a big dinosaur looking white woman. Look like he going home to Jurassic Park every time he go home. Nigga have to get on a step ladder just to get some sugar from that big tall white woman. And I don't know why we do that. Don't know why we do that. Go and get the biggest, ugliest white woman we can find. Clarence Thomas have to hug her on one side and the beast is so big and then run around and hug her on the other side. 
30 years, 30 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there's a rise in the Ku Klux Klan. 30 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the dream of the dreamer and his civil rights. 30 years after Minister Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik, El Shabazz, Brother Omar Wale, and his dream of human rights. 30 years thereafter, the white man still considers us three-fifths of a human being. At the Million Man March, we had well over a million to a million and a half, maybe even two million, convened by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. The first foolishness was talking about separating the messenger from the message, message which came out by Messi Jesse. He popularized this madness about separating the messenger from the message. Close to a million and a half, two million, and the crackers say he saw 400,000. <laughs> Why? It's because the cracker was still counting us as three-fifths of a human being. He got mixed up on them fractions. Got them fractions mixed up. 30 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 30 years after Martin Luther King Jr. A rise in the Ku Klux Klan, a rise in the Aryan Brotherhood, a rise in the American Nazi Party, a rise in the skinheads, a rise in militia groups, a rise in right-wing paramilitary hate organizations and hate groups and night riders and day riders as existed during Reconstruction. Thirty years after Martin Luther King Jr., the Supreme Court has handed down a ruling in various states across the country. Thirty years after Minister Malcolm X, Brother Omar Wale, El Hajj Malik, El Shabazz, one believing in civil rights, one believing in human rights. Thirty years after both of them, Malcolm said we must vote in a solid block. That we must vote in a black solid block. Thirty years after Malcolm, the Supreme Court has handed down a decision ruling it unconstitutional for you to have what they call majority, minority voting blocks. And so gerrymandering and remaneuvering. And so now they're taking small black districts, brown districts, and dumping them over into bigger white districts to bust up your black voting block which lets you know that you can register to vote all the hell you want to but voting will never get your behind out of this condition you running around registering to vote some of you you don't have to clap for me you say well uh, he, he's stepping on some toes now and uh, I know they got that camera running and I don't want the camera to catch me <laughs> applauding because I'm really with these folks and I'm with those folks. You should be with the truth. Stand up for the truth. Stop big bellying. Stand up on the truth from the greater cradle to the grave. That's your divine responsibility and duty to our people generations get undone and to our ancestors who have gone on. That's your duty and that's your responsibility. And so the voting blocks being busted up today. Unconstitutional to have a so-called majority minority voting district. 30 years after Dr. King the white man is killing us, it appears, like never before. You talk about slavery. You talk about the plantation. You talk about lynching. But when he kills a Yusuf Hawkins, when he kills a Philip Pinnell, when he kills an Anthony Baez, when he kills a brother Aswad, when he kills a Jerry Lee Amy and a Eula May Love, 
when he pulls the trigger and kills a Johnny Gamage or chokes a Johnny Gamage or when he kills a Tyrone Lewis in St. Petersburg or Pittsburgh or wherever we are. It's three over here. It's five over there. It's ten here. It's twenty there. It's fifty over there. He's lynching us today with a modern kind of lynching and he's killing us today faster than he killed us on the plantation. You can't hang as many from a tree and put a noose around their neck as you can pulling the trigger with an automatic and a semi-automatic hey, weapon. Hey. But you miss 30 years after King and 30 years after Malcolm making a careful, critical, and correct analysis of what's going on. <laughs> because some of you still want to hold on. Maybe nobody in here. <laughs> Maybe that's the ones who didn't come. In fact, let's establish some rules now. If I say anything that you don't like, just say he ain't talking about me. <laughs> talking about somebody else. All right? Some of us are crazier today than we were when Malcolm was here. Than we were when Martin was here. Some of you got your tikis and your sandals and your boobas and your dashikis and your red and your black and your green and your mud cloth and your kente cloth and Christmas. You had a damn Christmas tree in your house. You got your afro, you got your dreadlocks, you got your African braids, you got all of that. You got you crowned and gowned to the ground. But you got a dead tree that the Peckerwood sold you in your house with some kente ribbon on it. With a Santa Claus with red, black, and green on. You got a red, black, and green stocking over the fireplace. You have taken this madness and dressed it up and tried to give it an African flavor. Freedom is a law of nature and justice is deeply rooted in the universal order of things. And it is the divine intent of the almighty, all-wise God and creator that everything live equally under his creation. Let's look at it. The ant and the anteater. The chicken and the chicken hawk. It makes no difference what it is in nature. All have been created equally, but not equal. Everything must have food, you with me? Yes, sir. Water, air, and the proper environmental and atmospheric condition. The ant must have food. The ant must have water. The ant must have air. The ant must have the proper atmospheric and environmental conditions to continue to live. But on the other hand, the anteater must have food. It just turns out that the ant is the food of the anteater. The anteater must have food, must have water, must have air, must have the proper environmental and atmospheric conditions. Let's look at the chicken and the chicken hawk. Both of them must have food, both must have air, both must have water in the proper atmospheric and environmental condition. It just so happens that the chicken is the food of the chicken hawk. Nature is set up with predators and prey. And we have been the prey of the white man for the past four to six thousand years of his sojourn here on our planet. The brown man and woman, the red man and woman, the yellow man and woman, all have been the prey of the white man. The white man is our natural enemy. I uh, know nobody teaches that too much anymore. We've gotten sophisticated now. We talk all up in the clouds now. We talk all kinds of proper talk and talk that borderlines that we might be trying to get away, but we also look like we're trying to stay. All at the same time. We're dreaming of a brighter day in America. We got a search for tomorrow. 
in America. I cannot change. And I will not change. And God damn it, don't ask me to change. Because I'm not going to. The white man is not a devil, but the white man is the devil. And if the white man is not the devil, he's going to have to do until the real devil gets it. <laughs> Civil rights and human rights, the challenge of the 21st century. Look at it. If you're going to look at Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, you've got to look at them in phases. You got Old Testament Malcolm and New Testament Malcolm. You got Old Testament Martin and New Testament Martin. Old Testament Martin had a soft line. New, I mean, Old Testament Martin had a soft line. New Testament Martin moved toward a harder line. Criticized America, challenged America, called America, stepped out of the realm of Negro affairs, stepped out of the box into the international arena, and started comparing the war in Vietnam with what black people were facing right here in the hells of North America. On the Ho Chi Minh Trail or the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Martin started making a comparison. So that's Old Testament Martin and New Testament Martin. From a softer line to a harder line. And I don't mind being unpopular if I stand on truth. I must say that there's again an Old Testament Malcolm and a New Testament Malcolm. Old Testament Malcolm leaned toward a harder line. New Testament Malcolm moved toward a softer line. Give a damn whether you applaud. Don't give a damn whether you nod your head. Don't give a damn whether you smile. I know they're not going to give you your money back. So you might as well just sit back and relax and deal with it. Let's look at it. Old Testament Malcolm said, a revolution is bloody. A revolution knows no compromise. A revolution uproots and overturns everything that gets in its path. Old Testament Malcolm said, if you knew what a revolution was, why well, you wouldn't even use that word in your vocabulary. Old Testament Malcolm said, if you knew what a revolution was, why well, you get back in the alley. That's Old Testament Malcolm. Old Testament Malcolm said, all white folks are the devil. He said, none of them are any good. Right. He said, if you find one that you think is good, kill him first before he turn bad. <laughs> That's Old Testament mouth. <laughs> because just as sure as the sun shines, the guy's going to turn bad. I'm telling you, buddy, he's going to turn bad. No, make no mistake about it. The guy can't help it. Gee whiz. Golly gee. If you think anything else, it's far out, buddy. It's far out. G Maninis. <laughs> Old Testament Malcolm used not only spiritual and political and cultural terminology, he used revolutionary terminology as well. What does this say? Okay. Can we read it? <laughs> Everybody look and say, what does this say? Did he say, leave Malcolm alone? <laughs> Did it say stop criticizing Martin? <laughs> you really want to know what it said? You don't want to know what it said. You don't want to know what it said, do you? How many want to know what it said? Don't lie, you want to know what it said. How many want to know? Let me see your hand. 
How many don't want to know what it said? Raise your lying hands. <laughs> it just says, can you take a 15 minute break? Uh, at some point, take a 15 minute break. And uh, we, we're going to do that and then we'll, we'll reconvene. All right? Is that all right with everybody? He said, that ain't really say that. <laughs> everybody all right? We were talking about Old Testament Malcolm and New Testament Malcolm, Old Testament Martin, and New Testament Martin. Martin from a softer line to a hard line. Malcolm from a hard line to a softer line. Not a soft line, but a softer line. New Testament Malcolm went back to Saudi Arabia. Now he'd already gone in 59. And whatever he saw when he went back the second time, now believe me, he saw it the first time. Alright? Okay? Am I right? Yeah, I gotta drop some Ebonics up off in here. Alright. I drop a little Ebonics, y'all so y'all the photo know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? You the photo know. <laughs> he went to Mecca. This takes nothing away from him. These are lives that were not allowed to be private lives. These were lives that were lived before our eyes. You see, you can make your changes, and a lot of times people don't see your changes. Huh? You get in the shower and change. You sitting on the throne in the toilet and change and come out a new person. <laughs> Everything came out all right. <laughs> Some of you, you go to one Juma prayer. You're a changed person. You go to one Juma prayer, you come back, brother and your wife don't even know you. You are Khalid Abdul Rahman Suleiman Kareem the Magnificent the Third. Abdullah. Got an Arabic accent and one Juma prayer. You come back in the door, Salaam Walaikum Rahmatullahi Barakatuh. And she said, All right, baby. And she, Ah, oh, Salaam Walaikum, I love you, baby. And she said, Well, what's the matter, baby? No, I'm not baby anymore. I'm Khalid Rasul Kareem Rahman. You go on. She said, Nigga, I know you. You Willie Bobo. When you like. You go and take 30 minutes of karate. <laughs> Try to slant your damn eyes in the mirror. Want to eat chop suey and egg foo young all the time. We just wow. Robbed so thoroughly of a knowledge of self. Until everybody's culture makes an impression on us. The best way to defeat the oppressor's culture and alien culture is to live your own. It's to live your own. That's the best way to defeat it. New Testament Malcolm went back to Saudi Arabia after he had been the first time. And he went in and he came, he wrote postcards back. He sent letters back saying, here I am in Mecca. And it's a sight to behold. Here I am, he said, sleeping on the same mat, eating from the same bowl, drinking from the same cup with men whose skin is the whitest of white, whose hair is the blondest of blonde, whose eyes are the bluest of blue. This proves that it can work, that integration can work. He was interviewed, he said, I was in Mecca, he said, and I was, with, I was with men whose skin would be considered white in Mecca. He said, but they had Islam. And he said, Islam made them different. 
Islam didn't allow them to act like racists. And that's what the white man in America needs, Malcolm said. He needs Islam. Well, wait, let me tell you Come something. On. Come on. I've been to Mecca eight times. Okay? Yes, sir. I came back each time believing that the white man was more the devil after I got back than before I went over there. There are Muslims who don't want you to talk about this. We got to deal with the truth. Ah, stuff for a lie, stuff for a lie. There is no division in Islam. There is no invidious class distinction in Islam. I'll be damned. I was in Mecca at the Mithar or the airport. The biggest delegation to come to Mecca is represented by the blue, black, purple, black Nigerians and Senegalese from West Africa. West Africa sends the biggest delegation. Some of our brothers and sisters so beautiful, so black. Look like they were spit, they were spit ink. It's black, spit black ink. I saw some of them, their greatest dream even though they might be 70 or 80, some in their 90s, is to just make it to the holy city of Mecca one time in their life before they pass on. Some of them want to die in Mecca. That's their dream their whole life through. I saw elder sisters looking like they were 80 years, 90 years old in the airport. I saw racist white Arabs with their gutra and their methobe and all of that that they wear. I saw them run in the, through the airport and grab elder Nigerian sisters and Senegalese sisters and grab them and snatch them and just throw them across the airport. And I'd run to their white behinds and grab them and throw them against the damn wall. And couldn't speak Arabic, but I was telling them, that's my great grandmother that you just whether I ever met her before that's my great grandmother that I left in Africa generations down the line I saw ghettos in Mecca tell me nothing about Mecca I saw them come out with with bread in their in their robes in their thobes and black people be there stuck or stranded there because they just wanted to be somewhere close to what they call the sacred precinct and I see them arrogantly walk out and throw bread up in the sky and let it hit the ground and our people eat off the ground in an oil rich Saudi Arabia pumping billions of barrels and billions of dollars Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Saudi from a, a root etymologically, it's a similar root to Aswad, which means black Arabia. If you're confused on that, read Chancellor Williams. Dr. Chancellor Williams says that all of that area changed from black to brown to white. From black to to brown to white that they drove us from the centers of power and they set up in Saudi Arabia as they call it today they set up in what is called Israel today they set up in Syria they set up in Jordan they set up in Morocco and Algeria if I didn't say it they set up in Egypt they set up in Libya they set up in all of those areas and drove us from the centers of power and those areas changed from black to brown to white you don't want to talk about that you say well what about slavery Let's talk about slavery in Islam. I haven't seen the slavery, but I'll tell you what I did see. I was in Medina at Masjid al-Nabi, the Prophet's mosque in Medina. I saw these men with their eyes back in their head. Their temples were recessed into their head, gaunt looking. 
looking East African or looking Ethiopian or Somalian or Eritrean, which is all the same, all the same, until the white man started his game over there. They were rough on the women in the mosque. They were just grabbing women and throwing them all over the place. I didn't mind as long as they were throwing the white women. You know. <laughs> I wasn't like Malcolm. I didn't say nothing about that. But if they put their hand on a sister, I'd grab the hand and check them. So I asked, who are these men? And people say, you don't know who that is? It's a whole group of them. I said, no, I, who are they? They said, those. <laughs> They said, those are the eunuchs. My brain locked. <laughs> I said, what, are they unique? <laughs> what, what, what do they mean? And I guess they are unique. They said, the eunuchs, you know what a eunuch is. I said, yeah, yeah. They say, yeah, you know, they're reproductive. They're regenerative organ. Their sex organ was cut off by the white Arabs. I got furious. I said, what? They said they bring them over from Africa. <coughs> and they cut their regenerative and reproductive organs off so that they can watch over their harems and watch over their many women and they not have to worry about the African brother impregnating one of their women. I had nightmares, dreams about these brothers for nights. They were very antisocial. They didn't want to deal with anyone. They stayed among themselves. They had this kind of resentment, as I said, for women and for anything outside of their immediate circle. I saw that to the degree that I could see it with my own eyes, because some of you, you know, you asked them crazy questions. I didn't see that far. <laughs> Nah, somebody will say, did you really see? You know, that's a fool. And I know we got a question and answer period coming up, so I'm trying to discourage the fools before we even get started. One, right as a fundamental entitlement. Khalid Abdul Mohammed often spoke of human rights as intrinsic and non-negotiable. He argued that black people, like all humans, have a right to live freely without systemic oppression or racial discrimination. He called for dignity, respect, and opportunities for black individuals, emphasizing that these rights were not simply privileged but essentials due to every human. 2. Critic of Systemic Oppression Muhammad held strong views against systemic injustice that he felt oppressed black communities from racial profiling and police brutality to economic disenfranchisement and poor education. He often criticized institutions and governments he viewed as enablers of this injustice, calling for accountability and major structural reforms to dismantle oppressive systems. 3. Self-defense and black empowerment Known for his outspoken speeches, Muhammad encouraged black communities to protect themselves and assert their rights, sometimes using controversial language to emphasize his point. He believed that self-defense was not only justified but necessary for black people facing physical or institutional threats to their freedom and right. 4. Global Perspective on Oppression Muhammad's human rights perspective extends beyond the United States. He viewed the struggle of black people globally, whether in Africa, the Caribbean, or Latin American, as interconnected, highlighting the effects of colonialism and imperialism. He often called for global solidarity among people of African descent, encouraging them to unite against oppression in any form. 5. Demand for reparations and justice Muhammad was vocal about the need for reparation as compensation for the injustice suffered by black people, especially due to slavery and systemic racism. He argued that reparation were necessary not only for financial restitution, but as an acknowledgement of the historical wrongs that had deeply affected black community and shaped their current social and economic status. Thank you for watching. Do not forget to like and share your thoughts in the comment box below. Until next time, cheers and have a good one.